Okay. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the May Recreational Astronomy Night Meeting of the Toronto Centre RASC. My name is Paul Markov. I will be introducing the speakers this evening. And uh, hello to the viewers on YouTube as well. Thank you for joining us online. Um, the speakers for this evening are Andy Beaton, presenting The Sky This Month, uh, followed by uh, Jim Chung. He'll tell us about uh, building your own 10-inch chief speaker Planet Killer, that's a type of telescope. Uh, and followed by Ed uh, Trace, he'll tell us about the Car Astronomical Observatory, Recycling and You. Interesting presentation. And then finally, Artash and Arushi Nath will uh, talk to us about swinging to stability, how quadruple pendulums used in the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory aided in the discovery of gravitational waves. That's a mouthful. All right, so before we go ahead, show of hands, do we have any new members here for the uh, first time, members or not? Any guests? Show of hands? Not tonight? All right. Everybody's a member or been here uh, before. Very good. And I wanted to thank Tom Luton for hosting the meeting last uh, month. I was uh, home sick uh, with a cold, so thank you, Tom. And I think we're all set to go. I'll call on Andy to present the sky this month. Hey, thank you. Ah, it's fun to be back again. Uh, nothing happens this month. I just made up a bunch of lies to entertain you for a few minutes. People who have seen my talks before um, probably recognize the agenda. It's the same as always. Uh, big picture, planetary highlights, uh, lunar highlights, emission, oh, not emission nebula. No, I did something different this time. Comets and meteors, a variable star. There you go, Frank. And a double star and whatever spaceflight highlights I've been able to uh, scare up out on the internet. So starting with the big picture, um, this is what our sky looks like this evening, um, assuming it would be clear, which it isn't. Um, and notice a distinct lack of planets. If you can get to way down here, there's a Mars just off the edge of the, uh, the viewpoint there, but uh, it's a lousy view. Um, we do have our nice spring constellations, uh, Bootes, Virgo, uh, Coma Bernices, and all the great stuff that uh, you'll find in around there. Um, Jupiter is just going to be rising once uh, it gets really dark. And uh, Ceres is right there if you're uh, collecting your minor planets. It's more interesting when we get later in uh, this, uh, this month, um, getting towards uh, mid to late June. Uh, when you get up early in the morning, there are actually some things to see. Um, this is the uh, last night before the next meeting. The moon is uh, just about full, passing right by Saturn and Pluto, right down in Sagittarius. That's probably some kind of uh, good uh, photo opportunity there. Uh, Jupiter just off to the right there. Uh, Neptune is uh, well up in the sky. And we're looking at all of our, our best summer Milky Way constellations, uh, Sagittarius, Aquila, uh, Volpecula, Cygnus, and all the way up. So this would be a good time to uh, get out your telescopes and uh, look for all the fun stuff. The catch, of course, is uh, the nights are getting short. Um, we're coming up on the summer solstice. Um, Tonight, twilight ends at uh, 10.45 and starts again at 3.10 in the morning. By the time we get to the next meeting, we're looking at uh, almost 11.30 before twilight uh, ends and uh, it starts again at 2.40. So this is bad news for anybody doing any big astro astrophotography projects. Uh, you're only going to get a few hours of dark observing. Um, and actually, it's uh, lousy for everybody who wants to do some observing, especially if you have a day job and you need to get up in the morning. So the important dates, uh, the new moon on June 3rd, um, moon at Akbaji on May 7th, perigee on June, oh, sorry, 
Apogee on May 26th, Perigee on June 7th. Um, I always recommend this. Uh, it's an interesting project to take pictures of the moon at these two dates and compare the sizes and see just how elliptical the moon's orbit is. It's a fun science project if anybody has uh, kids or, or nephews or nieces who are looking for something. Uh, June 10th, Jupiter op at opposition. That's going to be about as good as it gets to uh, view Jupiter. It's going to be big. It's going to be close. And as I was saying before, for uh, you photographers, a moon and Saturn passing very close to each other on June 19th. So the moon, um, the new moon on June 3rd, which is good, full moon on June 17th, which is bad, unless you're working on one of the uh, lunar observing uh, certificates, which I hope everybody here is or has already completed theirs. Um, we have to make something of those, uh, those moony nights when uh, we can't see any of the good stuff. Uh, Lex Lunar X is on June 11th. Um, since we don't have anybody new here, I don't have to explain what the Lunar X is. Uh, there's the picture that comes along every month. You've all seen it. So on to planets. Uh, Mercury is just past superior conjunction. Um, later in June, it'll be appearing in the evening and should be a reasonably good target if you have a decent horizon and the sky is reasonably still. Um, Venus just barely trickles up above the sun in the morning sky. Um, it's going to be a lousy target for the next month. Um, it may as well not be there. Uh, Mars is sinking into uh, evening twilight. Um, it's going to be a lousy target. It's really far away. It's not much bigger than uh, Neptune or Jupiter is, or Neptune or uh, Uranus is in uh, in the telescope. It's that far away, so I wouldn't bother spending a lot of time looking for that. In the morning, um, assuming we're the kind of people who get up early in the morning, um, we've got uh, a decent set of planets then, uh, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus. Um, it's a really good time for looking at Saturn. The rings are wide open. Um, I don't think it's near its maximum yet, but it's going to be quite spectacular for anybody who's out there looking. Uh, the good news is they'll stay open throughout the summer, so if you don't feel like getting up at uh, 3 in the morning to see Saturn, you can wait a couple months and get a, a better look. Same geometry sometime later in the summer, uh, July or August. You're not going to see any real detail on either of the uh, the ice giants, Uranus or Neptune. Um, they aren't very close. They aren't very high in the sky, so they're not really optimally placed to observe this month. Um, Saturn doesn't get very high above the uh, southern horizon for us either, so it's not going to be outstanding for photography or looking for any um, details in the weather patterns, but, uh, but the rings are going to look good. Now what I don't have here is planetary highlights for the evening planets, and that's because the evening planets are basically no good this month. Um, we'll get to Jupiter showing up after midnight, and you can just see Mars trickling over the edge of the horizon um, not much after the sun sets, so we'll just uh, give the evening a rest as far as planet hunting. The spectacular show is going to be uh, late at night and into the early morning. Um, Jupiter is just fantastic right now. It's uh, it's big and it's bright, and anybody up around midnight or later, it's going to be pretty obvious where it is and what it is in the sky. Now, just yesterday, I was uh, going through the uh, Rascals mailing list, and somebody brought up the question of whether the uh, Great Red Spot is unraveling. Um, some people have apparently reported uh, streamers of red material uh, trailing away from it. And uh, some people are speculating that uh, after five centuries or so, the storm is finally coming apart. Now, that having been said, uh, two years ago, people were saying that uh, the storm was uh, fading and shrinking and disappearing, and it's still there. So don't make too much out of this speculation. But if you're out observing and you get a chance to look for the red spot, especially if you get to take pictures, because this is 
if it is unraveling, this will be seriously scientifically interesting, then, you know, go and have a look for it. About an hour after Jupiter rises, uh, Saturn comes up, and everybody loves Saturn. Um, it's the thing about Saturn is it's a really great target to uh, show for you know, kids and people who don't really know much about astronomy. Uh, unfortunately, kids and people who don't know much about astronomy aren't going to be out wandering around at 2 a.m. looking through your telescope. Uh, Pluto is still in Sagittarius, and that's going to make it a tough target. Um, it's 14th magnitude or so, and there's a million stars there. Uh, if you're going to go Pluto hunting, I would probably do it with a camera rather than the eyepiece. Um, then you can you know, take a shot uh, one day and a week later and try looking for movement rather than actually trying to spot the, the correct tiny dot in your eyepiece. Coming into Ophiuchus ahead of Jupiter is Ceres, uh, the other uh, minor planet. Um, it's uh, not particularly interesting to look at, but it's interesting to put it on your list and say, yes, I've seen minor planets. And it's a, a fairly fast mover compared to the other planets, so it's a, a fun thing to track from uh, night to night or week to week. So I do like to do some deep sky stuff. Um, I'm guessing everybody here is uh, working on their Messier certificate or their finest NGC or even the Hubble 400. And if you are, um, there's probably swarms of galaxies that you've got to track down. And a lot of them are ones that show up in the, uh, the big spring star clusters, the Virgo cluster and the Coma cluster. Um, the Virgo cluster is the uh, the better one for uh, for showing off to people. Uh, we get Mercurian's chain in the middle of it, which is a nice string of big, bright galaxies, and makes a pretty spectacular show for anybody you want to uh, to impress with your your telescope. Uh, the Coma Cluster, further away, um, the galaxies aren't as bright in the eyepiece, but uh, it's still all very interesting. The uh, showpiece in uh, the Virgo cluster is obviously M87. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the brightest elliptical galaxy. I wrote that down and I was certain about it and now I'm thinking about it. I'm wondering if there are others. But it's the, the most prominent member of the Virgo cluster. You can almost see it with binoculars on a good night uh, right from downtown Toronto. And of course, uh, it's been in the news recently. It's the uh, they got the uh, amazing image of the event horizon at the uh, black hole in the center. Um, the whole thing is uh, way beyond anything any of us are ever going to see through a telescope. But uh, the fact that it's there is something that you can you, you can look for and, and talk about. Um, something that is within our range, uh, in theory, is the uh, relativistic jet, the uh, the stream of material blasting out of the uh, of the black hole. See, there's the uh, there's M87. This is uh, the Hubble Space Telescope at work, and we get this uh, jet of material being blasted out of the uh, center of the uh, the galaxy by the black hole, and coming out more or less at the speed of light. Um, I'm sure there are people in this room with a telescope capable of taking a picture of that jet. Um, actually, has anybody actually tried taking a picture of the jet and succeeded? Not among this crowd, okay, but I'm, I'm sure you could. It's not, uh, it's not too far beyond the realm of possibility. Um, now, it's a really interesting project, and this is something you're not gonna do in Toronto. Um, there have been, I don't know, probably a dozen people who have actually seen the jet themselves with, the, uh, with their uh, own eyeballs through the, uh, the eyepiece. Um, you need a huge telescope, you need impeccable viewing conditions, you need, uh, you need to keep your optics super clean, but uh, it can be done and it has been reported by reliable observers. So if you want to put that on your uh, checklist, um, you, know, you can always look for it anyway. Now, none of us are going to be seeing this. This is the, uh, the black hole at the center of M87, or at least the event horizon. And that uh, event horizon around the middle, the, the dark part is about the size of our solar system, that order of magnitude, which 
gives you an idea of just uh, what amazing detail we're seeing in the heart of another galaxy. Um, you and I aren't going to see that through our telescopes, but uh, the, the fact that it's there is really super impressive. So for comets and meteors this month, um, the only meteor, meteor shower of any note, we're going to see the tail end of the uh, Eta Aquarids. It's uh, leftover debris from Halley's Comet. There are a couple of uh, minor meteor showers, the Tau Herculids and the June Mu Cassiopeids. Um, those were looking at maybe one or two meteors an hour. Um, the, uh, the source I was looking at was saying that uh, most observers can't tell these showers from random background uh, meteors. But if you do see meteors in that, uh, that time frame and feel inclined to track them back to the, uh, their uh, point of origin, you might find that you have seen star uh, meteors from these uh, weird and uh, little known uh, showers. Um, comets. Uh, no comets uh, showing up brighter than 12th magnitude in any of the searches I've been able to do. Um, deeper than that, yeah, there's a few, um, but I'm not sure any of us would be interested in looking for them, uh, which would probably make it a good time to go out and search for new comets. Um, if you happen to be uh, anywhere with a decent uh, western horizon in the evening or a eastern horizon in the morning, um, comets are still rec uh, being discovered by amateurs, uh, not as fast as the uh, the the uh, space uh, observed ones, but uh, they can be done, and it will make an observing project uh, worth trying if you've got uh, if you've got the time and the equipment. Now, obviously, we can't go through a month without uh, a variable star. Um, our, our Lyrae is uh, the one I've picked for this month. Um, it's the prototype of the entire RR Lyrae class uh, in Lyra. It uh, varies between uh, 7.2 and 8th magnitude. It's about 13.6 uh, hours period. Uh, what that means is it's uh, changing fast enough that uh, visual observations don't really capture enough detail. If you're going to go observing this one and collect serious data, uh, the best way to do it is with a photometer or some kind of camera that you can use to uh, uh, get one specific wavelength and compare that to the uh, uh, comparison stars at a very specific time. <coughs> I mean, you can look at it through the uh, telescope and just uh, eyeball it, but uh, the data you get is going to be considerably less, less useful than more precise data. What we're basically looking at is a, a, a star that's gone past the red giant phase. It's burning helium, and it gets into a state where uh, it pulses at a period related to the mass. Now, what that means, since we uh, can measure the period, we know we can calculate its mass. Once we know its mass, we can calculate uh, its absolute brightness, and we know how far away it's going to be. So this is uh, what we call a standard candle for measuring distances to globular clusters. And uh, Toronto's own Helen Sawyer Hogg uh, up at uh, the David Dunlap Observatory um, more or less made a career, um, or at least established her career, measuring these RR Lyrae variable stars in the middle of globular clusters. There's a decent collection of globular clusters around us, so anybody who's interested in taking photos of them and uh, doing very careful comparison of the brightness of some of the bluish stars, um, it's, uh, it's a thing that uh, can be done with uh, relatively modest equipment nowadays. Uh, I didn't see Blake here tonight, but of course I've thrown in a double star for him. Uh, Alpha Scorpius, uh, a.k.a. Antares. Um, I like this one because not only is it a double star, but it's also a variable star um, going from 0.6 to 1.6 over a long period of time. It's, uh, it's not a fast varying star, but it also has a uh, 5.9th magnitude companion. The catch is it's very close, so it's going to be very difficult to see. 
Um, there are two ways you're going to be able to see it. Um, directly with a six inch or greater telescope, uh, even then it's going to take uh, you know, uh, care, clean optics, um, careful collimation to make sure the uh, the images are nice and sharp and you don't smear out over the uh, bright star over top of the dim star. Um, the other interesting way is uh, unfortunately not happening in the immediate future, uh, occultations by the moon. If uh, since uh, Antares is very close to the ecliptic, every now and then the moon will pass right over top of it from our point of view. And when it does, you can see when the bright star disappears, there's still a dim star left behind. Or depending on the or orientation, uh, the other way around, the, uh, bright, the dim star will appear first and then followed by the, uh, the bright star. Uh, I haven't managed myself to uh, be able to split it. I have an 8-inch telescope, but i got to say observing conditions from where I am are, are pretty lousy looking to the south, and uh, the uh, turbulence in the sky from uh, Greater Toronto has just uh, messed up the every attempt I've made to observe it. So I'd be curious to know if anybody manages to actually see the thing uh, directly without uh, using the occultation method. Spaceflight is pretty quiet this month. Um, one Falcon 9 with 60 microsatellites is going up on May 23rd. Um, we get the usual ISS passes uh, late every night. Um, Heavensabove.com is your source for uh, times and locations. Um, I've stolen an event from somebody in uh, the next month and uh, reported uh, that Light Sail 2 is launching on a Falcon Heavy on June 22nd, or at least that's the schedule. Um, Light Sail 2 is an attempt to uh, uh, launch a, a small satellite that will unfurl a solar sail that will power its uh, motion around the Earth. I'm guessing at uh, since it's being launched from Florida and probably isn't going to go too high, we probably won't be able to see it here. But one never knows. Uh, keep an eye out for it. If it launches, maybe we'll be able to see it from here. If it is a solar sail, it should be pretty bright. So that's what's up this month. And I know what you're all saying. It's always cloudy. What if it's cloudy? Then. I've dug up a, a website called uh, Zooniverse.org, and what it is is a clearinghouse for citizen science projects, a place where uh, scientists who have a lot of uh, grunt work that needs to be done on their projects, things like identifying galaxy shapes or, uh, or tracking variable star behavior, can go out to the wide world, and people like us who are interested in contributing to science but don't actually have uh, jobs in science, can uh, step in and do some of the grunt work. Um, some of the current projects I was looking at this afternoon, uh, identifying features on the surface of Mars, um, identifying features in extragalactic star clusters, um, exoplanets around other stars, and many, many more. So. If you're like me and you're frustrated by the continuous cloud we're seeing, um, there is an outlet for you to do some astronomy in another way. And that's what we've got. Um, are there any questions? Yeah. Sorry? Any sun activity? Sun activity, um, I don't know about. Um, the sun activity we usually get are things like uh, solar flares and uh, prominences and interesting sunspots, and they're much harder to predict. Um, these are things that I can look in my astronomy software and say, you know, three weeks from now this planet is going to be here, but you know, I, I don't really have any idea what's going to be going on on the sun in three weeks. Anything else? Uh, Blake is online, and he does mention that the uh, jet in M87 uh, has been uh, imaged through the GBO oh, at really? the, the uh, CAR observatory. Uh, and he mentioned that uh, Ian Willeban has done it as well. And then also with the uh, Alpha Scorpius, mm -hmm. um, he mentioned that he has not been able to split it in an 8-inch 
11 inch or 12 and a half inch. Okay, so, all right. Thanks so very different. much, Blake. Anyway, so there you know, the uh, jet in M87 is a viable target for everybody who's willing to travel up to the, uh, uh, the observatory. So speaking of Antares, when I was young and I had a 60 millimeter Tesco telescope, I was trying to split stars and I thought, you know, I can probably do this. It's a red and got a green companion. So I pulled out my Tesco Barlow just to get the magnification up. And sure enough, there was a beautiful red and green. It was beautiful. <laughs> then I rotated the Barlow and the whole system rotated. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like my first telescope experiences too, yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you for uh, coming out tonight. So, how to build your own 10-inch Chief Spiegler Planet-Killing Telescope, also known as I Build My Last Telescope. And this is indeed a fact. I haven't built a telescope since 2015. Um, this is actually when I gave this talk originally. It was back in 2015. Uh, we were sharing um, library space for our uh, recreational astronomy nights. Um, and they were closing at 8 o'clock, so we had to get out of there fast. And there was a Jays game going on that night, so attendance was really low. So I thought maybe it might be relevant and still of interest for me to repeat this talk. And uh, so here I am. So I'm primarily um, a planetary imager. And we all like big, um, large aperture, large diameter telescopes because the bigger a scope, the more detail you can resolve. So in a, in a perfect world, I think everybody would have a big refractor. But unfortunately, a big refractor costs big money and also weighs big time. Um, so really, the most popular big telescopes tend to be things like the Celestron 14-inch schmidt Castlegreen, like we have. I think we still have it at the CAO. I'm not sure if we do anymore. Uh, it's a nice scope, large aperture fairly affordable and compact and fairly light. But all these um, popular large aperture telescopes 
have what's called a central obstruction. That's the secondary mirror. And that has an effect on the performance of a scope. So when you have a refractor where you have no obstruction, all the energy goes right into the center. But when you have a, a secondary mirror, like here, and most mirrors are expressed as um, a percentage of its diameter um, versus, the, of the di versus the diameter of the scope itself. So these secondary mirrors tend to be about 35% in size of obstruction. Some of the energy is, is, just of, uh, is um, di diverted to the first diffraction ring, and this causes um, a decrease in sharpness and contrast. Now, this is not a really good example because you really can't see the difference between the two, but the picture on the right is slightly less sharp and slightly less contrasty. So to mitigate this um, uh, design compromise, people thought, why don't we just tilt the mirror of the reflector so that we don't have to use a diagonal like this? And one of the most famous examples of this, and one of the first examples, was by British and uh, German astronomer Sir William Henschel. So uh, Sir William was not particularly concerned about central obstruction problems. Um, his mirrors back there are made out of this alloy called speculum, which is an alloy of copper and tin. And he had to constantly polish it because I guess it would oxidize quite, quite quickly. Um, but his reflectivity was really low, only 60%. So if he added a second mirror, the diagonal, or the secondary mirror, I should say, um, then he would, he would be reducing the transmission of light so much that his images would be too dim to, to observe. So what he did was he, his, he tilted the, the primary mirror, and he stood off to one side, and he held up his eyepiece, and he did his observing that way. And here you see him standing in front of his famous 40-foot uh, telescope. 40-foot um, refers to the length of the scope itself. It's actually a 4-foot diameter F10 uh, reflector. <clears throat> now, I think it was commissioned by King George III in 17, or 1689 for uh, 4,000 pounds. But the problem is, when you tilt the mirror, you introduce aberrations like coma. So he couldn't really see very clearly out of that scope, so he reverted to his original scope, which is the 20-footer. The it's, uh, it's a bit slower. It's an F13 18-inch um, reflector. And this one, he could um, boost the magnification up to about 160 times. So he actually got more useful work out of his old scope than with the new one. So this idea, oh, sorry, this, this is, these are the aberrations that you encounter when you tilt your, uh, tel your, uh, your primary mirror out of the way. You get coma, which is like a, a fantail on the, on the end of your um, object, or astigmatism, which completely distorts the, the, the object itself. So this idea, um, gained um, popularity. This is um, German film director Anton Kuder, and he devised something which he called a Schiefspiegler, which is German for oblique refractor. He used a concave primary mirror and a convex secondary to get um, a, a zero obstruction um, scope. But again, lots of uh, coma with this design, so he had to use a very slow scope at f25. He added a third mirror in 75, 19, 1975, I should say, and that helped to reduce the, the optical um, aberrations. And then finally, he added a plano convex lens midway between the secondary and the focal point, and he called this the catadiotropic sheath spiegler. And he got very nice images, um, very um, apochromatic. Um, sharp images. But the problem is these are scopes are very expensive to make because all the lenses had to be custom ground to specific um, prescription. So not easy to make at all, at least not for an amateur. Luckily, in uh, 2008, retired um, optician Ed Jones introduced his version of a tilted telescope, uh, the catadiotropic Herschelian Chief Spiegler or Chief Spiegler. And the advantage of this is that all these components can be bought off the shelf. The primary tends to be an either an 8 or 10 inch uh, parabolic mirror, f10 or slower, the slower the better, and a pair of 2 inch um, plano convex and plano concave lenses of opposite and equal um, focal lengths. And by tilting them a certain degree and at a certain distance away from the 
focal point, you get, you get correction of all the aberrations, and you get a nice sharp image with zero obstruction. Oh, there we go. Oops. I'll go back one more. So I thought I'd play around with, uh, I was just learning how to use SketchUp at the time. So I thought I'd design this scope of SketchUp and see if I could figure out any problems with it before I actually built it. So this is just a little movie. Can you actually run the movie for me or? Okay. I've been in the mouth. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Down, all the way down? Okay. Ah, oh, got it. Okay, thank you. So I thought I'd build a, a naked kind of a truss-like scope that, that aids in uh, the scope attaining thermal equilibrium quickly. And it's also a little easier to manufacture, I think. And also a little different too. Um, as, and you notice too that um, this scope has an optical flat. That's the little blue mirror at the top to reduce the length of the scope and make it a little easier to, to observe. Otherwise, you'd have a, a very long scope at F10 and then you'd have to be up on a ladder viewing through the very end of the scope. Okay. So, this is uh, made out of one inch diameter aluminum round and square tube. There's a Lasmandi dovetail plate. And there's the 10 inch F10, oh, it's actually F8, F8 mirror here. Uh, we've got an optical flat. And these are the plano convex and plano concave lenses that you can actually buy off the shelf from those companies. The focal length is not particularly um, important as long as they're equal and opposite. And they do have to be made of the, the same glass. So here I am, I'm cutting um, those cross braces. I don't have a tool sh uh, machine tool shop, so, you, so when, I, when I cut one, I have to use that as a template for the other ones to make sure they all turn out exactly the same. So there they are all cut up. This is um, a base Baltic birch with some ho holes for ventilation. That's like an 80s vintage Novak 10-inch um, uh, uh, mirror cell. And that's mounted on some um, spring-mounted bolts for collimation. Um, one of the cross braces, I think it's probably these two over here, don't come at 90 degrees, so they need a bit of a a custom angle to, uh, so I made a little jig so that the holes would be drilled correctly. And, and you can determine these angles by using these um, digital angle gauges, which are very handy. Yeah, we need this too also because we have to control the tilt of the primary. Um, the, it, the primary should only be tilted about three degrees off the um, vertical. Uh, if you tilt it too much, you introduce again too, too many aberrations. So that is kind of the skeleton. That's the, the upper assembly, close up. And I didn't really need to um, weld this or glue it down. It's all sort of fit together by friction. Although I think in the end, I probably put, ran some screws through them just to make sure they were, they were secure. Um, this is determining the focal length of a mirror. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> you wait for a nice sunny day at the right time of day, and you aim it at a piece of wood, and you make it burn. And then, and then I confirm that this indeed is an F7.9. It's, it's really quite accurate. And that's the um, optical flat mirror cell. Probably plumbing supplies. And then just again mounted on some, on some um, spring-loaded uh, bolts. Uh, this is the mounter for the focuser. I made a, a bit of a boo-boo here. I, I made the, uh, these two too wide, so the focuser didn't really sit on the metal. They sit sort of in between, and so the screw holes would not go through this, the, the meat of the metal, but through the side. So I ended up putting some cross braces and just rotating the focuser slightly so that all the holes would line up against metal. Yeah, this is just boring. Uh, how to make a cross brace. You drill a hole, cut in the middle, and then it's like well, those Lincoln logs you used to make um, uh, log cabins when you were a kid. And so I, I just rotated the focuser mount slightly so that all the holes met up with an actual piece of, of metal. And the most important thing are these Allen screws. This is what controls the actual tilt of the focuser so they can get the focuser exactly orthogonal to the secondary mirror. And I was just playing around here. Um, and 
Usually you can't weld aluminum because the, t the melting temperature is beyond uh, propane torch, but you can buy these sticks of aluminum that have a much lower melting temperature and you can actually use them and almost like solder and um, do aluminum welding that way. So I, just, I was just experimenting to see what it was like. But as it turns out, you, don't, you didn't really have to weld this at all. Um, it fit together quite nicely. So this is the very critical corrective lens assembly. As you can see, there is adjustments galore because there's a lot of fiddling around that you have to do. And by designing all these adjustments in, that allows you to, to, to um, position these lenses at their, at their optimal locations for the best optical effect. So this allows the whole assembly to slide back and forth relative to the focuser. That's the plano concave lens. That's the plano convex lens. As you can see, they're mounted so that you can actually slide them um, in and out so that the, you can actually have the beam of light go through not the center of the lens, but off center, which is actually the way the, the design is meant to be if you, for, for optimal effect. And you can adjust the separation angle between them, although that usually is fixed at an at a, at a optimal angle. And you can also adjust the, the angle of the whole thing with, with this, um, this thing right here. It's, uh, it's a big bolt with um, a compression spring, so you can, I can wind it up and, and cause this whole structure to swing this way. Yeah, so here's a close-up of, of one of the lenses. So you can see that I can actually turn the screw and cause the lens to move laterally and have the light path actually go um, off-center. So <laughs> I just discovered this. I, you can buy these tension springs everywhere, but you can't buy compression springs. And then, but you can make your own because all you have to do is just deform them, just stretch them until they're, they're, they're permanent deformed and then you have an instant compression spring. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, normally when you collimate um, a, a reflector, you put a little center spot on your, on, your, on your mirror because that center spot is occluded by the secondary. So it never, it, it's not gonna be in, in the way. But you can't, you can't spot these mirrors because um, they're, they're, the whole mirror surface is being used for um, light transmission. So I just um, made up some circles on, on, um, with Photoshop that were the right size and to, to, to aid in the collimation. So I, I would actually cut the circle out and put it on the mirror so I know exactly where the center of the mirror should be. And you'll, you'll see that these guys in action in just a few more slides. So some of, us, some of you might be wondering, how, how do I know exactly where to place these things because it's, it, it, you know, it's almost like guesswork, but no, it's not. There's a, there's a specific plan and there's computer software, for example, Oslo is one of them, where if you plug in all the parameters, in this case, they're starting with an eight inch primary mirror and they've got the focal length there, the thickness of it, they even have the, um, yeah, the, there's diameter. And so you've got, you've got your three axes. The X, Y axes would be the plane that all the optical components live in and the z-axis would be the, the plane where the incident light goes through. So here it is, we've got the primary mirror tilted three degrees off the vertical. And then we've got the first uh, plano concave lens there, that's, that's its focal length, and that's the tilt that it requires. And this is the plano convex lens, and that's the tilt it requires. So the tilt between the two of them is about 15.4 degrees, as you can see if you read them off. And so this software tells you exactly where to place all your components to get the best optical uh, image quality. So here I am, I'm collimating the focuser itself to the optical flat. So you can see I've taped that little Photoshop paper circle over the flat, and so I know exactly where the center is. So I can adjust these Allen screws until the laser hits the center of the optical flat. And then I collimate the optical flat to the primary. And again, here it is. You see the laser beam bounces off the, the, the optical flat, and then you adjust the optical flat until it's the beam bounces off the center here. And then you have to, of course, collimate the primary. And as it turns out, the Home Depot bucket is a perfect fit <laughs> for the, for the, for the yeah. mirror cell. So I just cut a hole in there so the, light, the laser will pass through, and the center of the bucket is actually the center of the mirror. <laughs> and so, so you want it to pass through the center. And so it's slightly off, and then, now it's on. And this is me trying to determine exactly where the optical flat should go, because obviously if it is um, in the wrong position, it might not be seeing all the light. 
and if it's um, or if it's too close, then it's it's being wasted, and so that that's the circle of, of light produced by the primer on a sunny day. But I also noticed that another problem: um, this brace is in the way; it's cutting off part of the valuable light from the primer here. So I ended up having to redo that part, and cutting out a hunk. Yeah, not not the way it's supposed to go, but it, it worked. <clears throat> so you can see that it actually worked out quite well. This. Um, Circle is the, the optical flat, and the red circle is the primary. And so the primary is maybe touching a little bit on the frame still, but it's okay. And, but it's it's uh, but it's still well within the, the confines of the optical flat. And this is something um, that also is critical. You have to adjust what's called the back focal length, where the focal point, the distance between the focal point and the back of the last lens in that pair. So you just tape a piece of cellophane, and then you focus. That's the moon that's actually showing up there. So you focus until you get a sharp image. Then you measure from that piece of tape to the to the uh, to the to the last lens, and just make sure that it's in that close to that critical value that's supposed to be. And if it's not, you can move the the lens assembly back and forth. So the structure really is not as rigid as it should be because once I'm mounted on a, on an equatorial mount. There's a bit of sagging, and so you can see the collimation that was okay standing up is off when it's mounted. So I had to re-collimate the mirror. There you go. And this is to show that the, the beam is actually passing straight vertical. So I had made up a little a jig where the light should be coming through, and, that, and, the, and the, the return beam from the primary should be, and that's where it, that's where it is. And so you can see, this is, um, I'm not sure if this is before, if this is without the, the I, I think, that, I'm not sure where I got this picture from. This might have been before I was fiddling with it. But I was happy after I fiddled with, with the tilt and everything that I got a better picture. So this is, this is Crater Coper Copernicus. You can see that this is a lot better than this. And, but the interesting picture is, this is what you get when you tilt the primary only and you have no corrective lenses in the optical train. And then when you put the optical train back in, that's that little triangular piece of hinged metal with the two lenses, the, the great improvement that you see. So this is what Herschel would, would probably see. I mean, it's terrible, really, in terms of what he could observe, you know. And that, there it is um, in action. I like to show this telescope because it doesn't look like a telescope. Most people do not equate this as what a telescope should classically look like. <laughs> and finally, I, I found this guy a few weekends ago, and he told me that summer is finally here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, any, any, any questions? Yes. Oh. The question was, how long did it take you to do this? You know, I, I, I can't remember. Um, it, it was a, a phase in my life where I was feverishly making telescopes after telescopes. Um, I, probably design took a lot longer than building. You know, uh, building maybe took a couple of weeks, but the design part was, you know, thinking and collecting the materials probably took months. Yeah. Uh, at the very back. Oh, sorry. We have a question from online. Uh, how do you mount a camera onto the telescope? Yeah, um, you, you would just use one, one of those small planetary cameras and you just mount it in place of the eyepiece. Yeah, so you, so you could mount anything heavy like a DSLR, but you could, you could mount those tiny cameras that you use for planetary imaging. How much money did the uh, lenses and the optical flat cost? Good, good question. There's thousand. Good question. Um, I think it's, it was probably under grand, I think, for the build. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it does shake a bit. You're right. So, so you have to be careful in what conditions you're using it in. I, so, so if I were to redesign it, I probably would redesign it with more, more bracing and, you know, but, but uh, it does work. Yeah. Yes. Once it's all set up and uh, collimated, does it take a lot of tweaking once you move it out into the field and point it at different parts of the sky? 
Yeah, um, you know, I haven't really used it that much since it was made, so I cannot give you a good answer. I suspect that because it's not as rigid as it should be, that it probably does require a bit of tweaking after you transport it, you know, and stuff like that. But once it's once it's set up at, at your site, it should be it should be pretty stable. Yeah. Uh, yes. You wrote uh, a book of uh, projects. Yes, that's Is this in there. Uh, no, it, it, I'm, I'm hoping for a second edition. So, <laughs> no, that's, I'm, that's just that's just hopeful wishing, wishful thinking. Uh, no, no, it didn't. It didn't make it. Um, it's too bad because I, I would have loved to have included that in there. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Good night. Okay, so my presentation is entitled The Car Astronomical Observatory, Recycling, and You. And I think this is a pretty valuable topic as now we're starting to move into the usage season for the CAO. And uh, some people are kind of waving their ears up there. Let me turn up the... Uh, talk a little bit louder. Okay, fair enough. Okay, so... Why, why is it a topic for tonight? So the CAO, as people who have been there know, is a pack-in, pack-out location. You bring your stuff, you take it back out. There's no garbage collection, there's no recycling collection. You have to bring it home. Um, the thing is, it's a busy site quite often. There's more than just you up there. There are plenty of people, so everyone throws their recycling in one place, and one person gets to carry that home. That person might be taking it to any place in the GTA or even outside of the GTA. I don't know where all our members and users come from. And the problem is that the wrong items in the recycling load will contaminate it, and contamination is not a good thing. So my qualifications on the subject, um, since the start of the year, I actually inspect recycling for the City of Toronto. Um, I'm not here as an official representative of the City of Toronto, although I asked my supervisor whether I can mention it, and he said, yeah, okay, no problem. Um, more to the point, and I wanted to do this uh, even before I started this position, is I have been at the CAO, I have taken home recycling, I have sorted out in my driveway, and I've had like 20 minutes of this is not really very good recycling, Ew, it was smelly and messy and sticky stuff. And my guess, this was like a year ago, 20% of what was in that recycling bag was not, in fact, valid recycling. Just to give you an example, these are some of the pictures of recycling bins I took today. And every one of those bins got sent off as garbage instead of recycling on my judgment. So it does happen. So surprising things about recycling. And the first one is... Recycling does not mean you are doing good for the planet. So I, I think there's this feeling that, you know, I've put the stuff in the recycling, I get a gold ecological star. And unfortunately, that is not quite the case. Um, the three R's for the people who have learned them in school or heard about them are in order of preference, reduce, reuse, and only then recycle. Um, recycling mitigates some of the impacts you have on the environment, but it's not something that makes the environment better. It just lessens the damage. Um, 
for example, plastic single-use water bottles that people buy in those big packs. Um, you can say that, okay, you know, the plastic bottles recycling, I'm going to recycle the bottles, so it's all good. However, I mean, leaving aside the fact that this bottling factory is pulling out megaliters of water from some aquifer or some lake, um, the bottles need energy to be created. There's pollution and various environmental impacts from the making of the bottles. Then, then when they come to you, and of course they're shipped to you by a truck that causes lots of pollution, and you take it from the store home, which causes more pollution, and then you take it up to the CAO, carrying some more weight with you. Um, in the end, you know, even if 90% of them get into the recycling stream, and I kind of doubt it, um, some of them wind up in Lake Ontario. I live close to the shoreline, and every time there's an onshore wind, it's amazing how many water bottles wind up washing up on shore. Even if they go into the recycling stream, they, they're, they're not recycled perfectly. They'll probably come back as some degraded plastic product, you know, maybe packaging or something, because no one can guarantee that they're food safe anymore. And when that gets recycled, it gets degraded even more. So plastics and paper products, and paper is good recycling, but you can't recycle the same paper indefinitely. It becomes worse and worse until it winds up being sludge. So like about its third trip through, it's toilet paper. And that's pretty much the end of the line for it. And I mean, speaking of plastic bottles, the new policy at the CAO is very much to encourage people to go up there and drink from the tap. And that is way better than coming up with some recyclable plastic bottles and taking them back and recycling them properly. So it's much better to reduce and reuse first. So second thing that I want to tell you about recycling is that when that stuff goes to the transfer station or the recycling facility, no one looks through it and says, oh, this is some stuff that, oh, I, th I think this is recyclable and, oh, this might not be recyclable. Um, they're not going to figure it out for you. They're not going to sort it out for you or, giving you or they won't give you a gold star for trying. Like, don't be aspirational and think, well... This might be garbage, but I'm going to put it in recycling because it, it makes me feel better. And I think that's why I made that first point, that recycling isn't beneficial to the environment. I think that there's kind of the, this is, I don't know why I bought this stuff, but you know, if I put it in the recycling bin, it's all good. Not really. Um, people say, and I've heard people say, oh, this should be recyclable or, you know, this ought to be recyclable, but that doesn't change the various technical and logistical constraints and the financial constraints on what is actually able to be recycled in our current system. So, um, and again, I don't know the whole details of the process, but you've got whatever can be technically recycled, it's how much it costs, who wants to try to recycle it. Um, so, you know, when you, when you think, well, you know, this really ought to be recyclable, that doesn't really matter. You have to check to see whether it actually is recyclable under the current system. So the final thing is that if there's enough contamination in recycling, so I got a lot of recycling, it could be a bin, it could be your household bin, it could be a big bin. If there's enough contamination in there, the whole thing will go for garbage. No one's going to sit there and say, I'm going to pick out the 25% of contamination and recycle the rest of it. There's just not enough time. There are not enough people. Um, I mean, a garbage truck will show up with seven tons or 15 tons of recycling all packed in there. Trying to pick through that is not fun. Even the uncompressed bins that I look at, sometimes I go, ooh, I don't even, even know what's in there. So. One surprising conclusion about recycling is, if you are in doubt whether it's recycling or not, put it in the garbage. Like, it, you're not destroying the environment just by putting it in the garbage. You, you may actually be saving the recycling. It's not quite that pessimistic. I'm gonna get to the more optimistic <laughs> stuff, but. <laughs> right, so you want to do your part, and like, I've, I've just kind of knocked some, 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 uh, gold star, you know, do my best stuff out. Um, I want to do my part, so don't be in doubt. So like I say, if you're in doubt, put it in the garbage. Don't be in doubt, know your stuff, and then you know, yeah, this is definitely recycling, this definitely isn't recycling, and just go with that. Um, find out is what is recyclable in your system. 
So I'm speaking as someone who knows what's going on in Toronto. Most of the other big municipalities will be similar. However, even in Toronto, if you own a house or, or probably a town home and you take out your own bin to the curb, you are on city collection. So the city has certain rules. We have the green bin, we have the garbage bin, we have the re recycling bin. It's all pretty clear. Same thing if you're in Mississauga or in Peel region or in Durham region or York region. If you're living in a larger apartment building, you may be on city collection in Toronto or you may not be. You may be on a private collector who has different rules, if he has rules at all. And like, I don't know what that would be. You'd have to talk to your property manager, your landlord. Your property manager probably knows because they actually pay the bills as to like who they're paying to take away your waste. It all costs money. So good sources of information. So up-to-date guide sheets, and I can't emphasize up-to-date enough because things change. Things become acceptable in the recycling stream, the technology changes a little bit, or something no longer is acceptable. So one thing that got me is I used to take my glass jars, I'd take the lid off, I'd rinse them out, I'd put the glass jars in the recycling bin, I'd put the lids in the garbage because that's what I remembered. I just looked at a recent sheet and they say, put the lids back on. And the only way I find that out about that change is to actually review what I'm doing from time to time to understand if I've kept up with stuff. Um, online websites. So Toronto does have a nice online website. If you go to toronto.ca, and if we have some time, we can probably pull up that website at the end of this presentation. There's, you, you just type in like Google, you know, I, I've got a horseshoe. What should I do with a horseshoe? <laughs> probably says put it in the garbage. Um, so it's called Waste Wizard, and there's also now an online phone app. I don't have a phone to be able to demonstrate it. We can load it on your phone, just like type in whatever it is that you have. It'll tell you. The one thing I would have to say is recycling is a huge, complicated business, so I don't know all the details, and you can probably f catch me out on something that I don't know. Well, you can certainly catch me out on something that I don't know. No one really knows it because it's a case of what the collections do, what happens at the transfer station, what happens at the reuse facility, which is contracted out, and then it has to go off to various recycling things, bundled up, shipped across the oceans. It's a huge logistics chain. But at least the waste wizard is kept up. And any sheets that you have, like if you get the waste calendar, which in Toronto we get a calendar saying, or at least I do as a homeowner, I get one that says, you know, your pickup is on Wednesdays and here's the schedule. It has those sheets saying, you know, here's what's recyclable, here's what isn't. Use that one. Throw away your old one from last year's calendar because things may have changed. So there are also bad sources of information. Um, recycling guides from a different system. Like if you're taking recycling from the CAO home to Mississauga, do not look at the Toronto recycling sheet because there might be some details that are going to be different. Different technology, different contractors, different processes. You don't know that. You have to actually look at who, who is going to take it where and go with that particular collection system's guidelines as to what's recyclable. Um, recycling guides more than a year old, things change get rid of the old ones, recycle them if possible. Um, Uncle Marty, who has seen a YouTube video about recycling, I've had a few people say, I know what recycling is and I know how that plant works and what you're saying is not contamination. I don't really argue with them, I say, yes sir, that's very interesting. Uncle Marty, who knows what's recyclable in his apartment building, as I mentioned before, a lot of apartment buildings in the city of Toronto, and I would expect the same to be true of other jurisdictions, are not on municipal collection. They have different rules, so if you're taking it back to your house and putting it in your own bin, you can't necessarily go by what's recyclable in an apartment building somewhere. Um, Uncle Marty, who knows what's recyclable in his workplace? Same deal applies. Most businesses are not on city collection in the city of Toronto. They're done by private contractors. The private contractors might say this is recyclable or this isn't. I'm going to have an example of that a little bit later on. So don't listen to those things or don't listen to people saying, oh yeah, I'm sure that's recyclable because, you know, they might not know. 
If I say that, you can still challenge me, but I probably know a little better. So there's some things that are pretty universally recyclable. Um, things like newspapers, magazines, cardboard, corrugated boxes, or cereal boxes. Um, not, but there are still exceptions there, like coated cardboard, the stuff that some vegetables come that's like waxed. That's not recyclable. So even there, there's little tricks, and you have to check things out. Um, metal cans, pretty much recyclable. I don't know whether other, other locations say what Toronto does, which is you know just pop the lid inside the can and kind of crush the can closed. It would make sense because that would mean that the sharp lids aren't really ready to come out and like cut something. Uh, aluminum cans, probably one of the most valuable items in recycling. So you're probably safe to put that in the CAO's bin no matter who's taking that recycling home. Uh, not recyclable in the city of Toronto. And I forgot one thing, which is black plastic, like black plastic plates, black plastic forks, black plastic whatever. Don't. Um, coffee cups, Tim's or whatever, soft drink cups, McDonald's, Burger King, not recyclable, not organic, put them in the garbage. The interesting thing about that is I was talking about this with a friend on the weekend, and he said, well, Tim Hortons cups are recyclable in Mississauga. I went, that's interesting. I checked and they aren't. Um, but he was say he was he just goes out there to work. He lives in the region of Durham. He goes out to Mississauga to work. And his workplace, the contractor says they're recyclable according to the guides. What I find a little bit interesting there is we know how much how many cups there are floating around. Toronto in Toronto they're not recyclable. In Peel region they're not recyclable. In York region they're not recyclable. In Durham region they're not recyclable. I kind of gave up there. If these big municipalities can't figure out how to recycle Tim Hortons cups, what is that contractor doing, I wonder? Like sometimes they say, put your recyclables here, but you don't know what happens when the truck comes. I kind of have an idea because I see those trucks, sometimes they chase us around on our routes because we just have to keep ahead of them. Um, paper towels or napkins, not recycling. Like I was saying, things degrade over time. So the paper towels, by this point, if you try to recycle them, they turn into porridge. They've been recycled so many times, the wood fibers get shorter and shorter and shorter until they're just like sludge. So put them in the composting bin if you're taking it back to the city of Toronto. Do not put it in the recycling. That's one of the big problems we have with schools and community centers. They have bags and bags of paper towels and they put them in the recycling. We have to tell them, no, this doesn't work. Um, random pieces of plastic packaging. So as I mentioned, there's no one at the transfer station who's gonna go look at those little numbers on some, some random piece of plastic. They go by the shapes. So it's all sorting and saying, okay, this is a margarine tub, so we kinda know what, what a margarine tub is made of, and it's part of this stream. No one's gonna pull this item of whatever it is that isn't like a defined item and look and see whether it says, you know, one in the little triangle or three or whatever. So. Don't even bother. Um, wood, metal bits, stocks, stuffed toys, yesterday's ice pilaf. I've seen all those in recycling bins. <laughs> so, I mean, it's funny, but it's true. It happens too often. Um, I, I'd be shocked that drinking goes on at the CAO, but I've heard reliable reports <laughs> that possibly might. So, so the problem with, with cans like that is unless you thoroughly empty and probably rinse out the empties, you get beer pooling in the bottom of the bag, and I have to struggle with that with some recycling that I took back. And that's contamination right there. As soon as it's like floating, that's not good at all. Um, the beer store takes back everything. So the man has already taken your deposit. Now, do you want to leave the man with your 10 cents or 20 cents? Maybe you do. But then give it to charity. I understand that there's a there's actually a separate basket at the CAO where you can put in your depositable uh, containers and it gets collected by charities and it actually goes to someplace useful. So don't throw your beer bottles or your wine bottles in the recycling bin. It doesn't help in a couple of different ways. Um, so maybe, like I don't know how well that's marked. Maybe uh, someone can mention it afterwards for questions, but I think we want to make it pretty clear. 
Um, in fact, if you go to the beer store's website, you find out what they take back, and you can, you can see where it's underlined. It's kind of small text, but they do say, we take back all bottles, cans, cartons, caps, kegs, plastic bags, and can rings that we sell to consumers. So even the beer caps. If you're going back with your empties, they say, you know, we should, uh, in a different part of the website, I'm not going to go into the details, they say throw the beer caps into, into a plastic bag separately. Um, beer caps are not recycling, so if you do say, I'm going to leave that bottle for charity, I guess you just throw the caps in the garbage. And you can find out more details about how they want stuff arranged on their website. I actually hadn't gone there before, so again, I'm learning something from this, in fact. Okay, so try to know who is taking the CAO recycling ahead of time. So I don't know how things are arranged, but if one person says, yeah, I'll take it, find out, are you taking it to the city of Toronto? Are you taking it to Peel Region? Let us know, and then we kind of know which, which rules of engagement we have to go with. Um, hopefully that person is better up on, if it's a different region, hopefully they know what is recyclable and what, what isn't. Um, if you wind up leaving out some things that are recyclable in their system by accident, it's not the end of the world. What we don't want is you putting stuff in that isn't recyclable. Like I say, contaminating is actually worse than leaving one or two items out just to be safe. It's always good to confirm and check even the well-known items. So people probably know that in the city of Toronto, a pie plate or an aluminum roasting pan is recyclable. How about aluminum foil? It's not recyclable. It's too lightweight, it flies away, so put the aluminum foil in the garbage. Just as um, soiled paper, soiled paper plates, soiled with food are recyclable, sorry, organics. Don't, I did not say recycling, I said organics. But if it's wax paper, it's garbage because wax paper is not compostable. And there's all these little things. And, you know, I wish it wasn't the case. I wish it was much simpler than that. But I'm not sure how it can possibly be simpler. It could be if you, we hiked our garbage fees by like a thousand percent and had people like picking, picking out the stuff that works and doesn't work. But that's a whole different sort of ball game. Remember, if in doubt, put it in the garbage. I mean, it might up the garbage, but honestly, if you hide 25% of your garbage in the recycling, you're still creating garbage and possibly a bigger problem for the valid recycling in the recycling bin. Uh, a couple quick tips that I can think of. If your recycling bag has to be double bagged for you to take it back to wherever you're taking it, it's probably contaminated in garbage right there. Like if there's liquid sloshing about, that's not good. Uh, Toronto is okay with organics and regular plastic bags, unlike Peel Region, which I believe specifies that it has to be biodegradable or compostable. Toronto is fine with regular bags, just don't have a cucumber in a bag and put it in another bag in another bag. The more layers of plastic, the harder it is to get the cucumber out from the layers of plastic. So in conclusion, yes, please do recycle because it does take stuff out of our landfill, but do it with care. Um, you should definitely, what happened there? Did I press something? Wow, the recycling gods are upset with me apparently. <laughs> Yeah, yes. <laughs> so, maybe I can just go to the grand finale and, uh, can glossy paper be included in the newspaper box? You know how there's yes. inserts or additions yeah. to a newspaper? Generally, yes. 
So you can put, say, glossy magazines in recycling, no problem. I think there can be some limits to that. Like if it's like magazines with perfume packets, that's not so good. You'd have to pull out the perfume packets. And certainly if it's, if it's foil paper, like foil Christmas wrap, that is not recyclable. You know, that, that's one that I would probably, if you only have a few kind of fairly glossy things, but it's still kind of obviously paper, maybe with a lot of printing on it, yes, I would put it in there. Yep, I would recycle that. Uh, Ed, yes. what, what about the more practical, maybe we should be thinking about just uh, what does uh, Gray or Simcoe County doing with their recycling, and we try disposing of it instead of from the CAO all the way back to the GTA, from the CAO to a dump site mm -hmm. uh, somewhere nearby? You could try to do that, yep. Um, the limitations that I find on smaller municipalities is the hours of opening may be awkward. So if we have a good new moon weekend, they may only be open on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Um, I don't know, like it would also, and for one, for another thing is you would need the license to dispose of it in the proper county. I believe the CAO is in Gray County. Like you're not going to take it to Simcoe County because they're going to say, what are you doing? Because you're not a resident of Sim Simcoe Com County. And that's another possible problem. I don't know for sure, but I know my friend who's got a cottage, he's got a card, so they don't let any people just into the uh, transfer facility. You have to have your card and you have to show it and say, yes, I'm, I'm, fr I'm this property owner. So it's worth investigating for the CAO committee. I'm not sure how practical it would be. You'd have to see what, what sort of restrictions Gray County has, what their opening hours are, where the location is. Um, the other thing I would say is you know you're going home and you probably have a garbage and recycling bin at home. The Simcoe, or the Gray County ones may not be on the way. They might be in Meaford, let's say. I don't know. Yes? Um, okay. For me, this is interesting. Um, I live in a condominium building, yes. and we have a quote unquote green committee. Yes. And I think they do a good job. They had a, a survey, uh, people come in and survey mm -hmm. our garbage and our recycling, et cetera, yes. in, in an attempt to improve mm -hmm. uh, the recycling. But the argument they use is that we're paying, this is what I've been told anyway, we're paying for the garbage. So if we can de decrease the garbage, we don't have to pay as much to the city, but we don't have to pay for the recycling. That is a very good point, and I will confess that I wanted to check your building the other day, but it had already been picked up. It was on our secondary route after we'd done our primary route. <laughs> Just saying. It's not quite that simple. Yes, you pay for the garbage all the time, and your recycling is free. If you contaminate your bin with too much garbage, like I had those pictures of it, you pay for that bin. So you do not save money. By, by throwing stuff in the recycling. But, because I think uh, our, our condo fees are high, so people are always trying to save money. Mm -hmm. And when I go to throw my recycling in the bins, I see stuff that I know should not be in there. Well, I'm gonna just make a note of oh, that. Sorry, so you're, and, you know, and tomorrow you're, 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 the office. You're, you know where I live, so you, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But I mean, so what you're saying is that uh, if there's enough of that in, in that bin, they know the, where they got it and they will charge it back to Correct. us. Correct, and it's, it's worse than that. So if it's a 25% contamination in these big bins, and I'm talking the big dumpster bins that are like yay high and big. Yeah. Um, so it's 25% contamination, you could obviously take like four recycling bins and fill one garbage bin, which you'd pay for. But if all four of them are contaminated enough, all four of them go as garbage and you wind up paying more because you wind up paying for five bins instead of, you know, an extra garbage bin. Can I quote you to my manager? Sure. All right, just to finish off here, now that we have uh, transmission back from, uh, from recycling land. Um, smaller lots of high quality recycling or organics are much better than larger quantities where you kind of say, ah, this, I feel less guilty by throwing this in the recycling. It really is, is better. It's easier on the system. It's cheaper for us to sort it out. We don't have to do the sorting. So that's the way to go. You're, you're doing something good by throwing stuff in the garbage. It's not like, my God, I feel better if I throw this random object into the recycling bin. And in fact, that was, I was pretty much at the end anyway. So are, are there? <laughs> any other questions? Yes, sir. 
Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. But so you did ask uh, what the committee is doing towards looking uh, how to properly handle both waste and recycling. Mm -hmm. um, I, I should point out because we are a landowner uh, in Grey Towny in the municipality of the Blue Mountains, we have checked with the waste department. And the reason why we don't have uh, a bin of our own for waste and for recycling on our own driveway is because, as most people know, our road does not get year-round service because there's no winter service once the road closes in with snow in November or beyond and then until the road opens again in May or so. So their trucks cannot service our property, our driveway. But what we've been advised to do is to contact the local neighbor someone who is on road service uh, all year round and be able to negotiate to put our own bin next to their bin at their driveway. So this is something we've been trying to do. It's kind of a moving target. And we had such a relationship uh, with the property that was owned by the Jorgensons up until recently until they sold. Um, so we were allowed to put our garbage and recycling there, which we were doing. But since the property was sold, we've not actually been able to contact the new owner. So we're in the process now of trying to negotiate with a convenient driveway on the sixth line. Uh, we do have people on the 21st side road that we probably could hook up with, but we don't want people to have to make a sort of a milk run, depending on how they're going back to the city, to be able to take garbage to our bin. But once we do get bins, uh, both for garbage and for recycling, then we will have very defined lists of what can go into our recycle in our own Blue Mountain pickup. But in the meantime, yes, it, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's where we are anyway. Yep. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Here we go. It's less of a question, more of a comment. Uh, for our last speaker, I want to thank you for recycling your presentation. <laughs> I, I think it might be closer to reuse, but that, you know that's even better. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Thank you very much, Ed. Thanks. Yeah, very, very useful presentation. Very. Ready? Ready? Great. 
Hi, my name is Artash Nath. Hi, my name is Arushi Nath. Yeah, so um, today we're going to present to you one of our latest projects. It's called Swinging to Stability, basically how quadruple pendulums can be used to help discover gravitational waves in the LIGO, the Light Inferometer Gravitational Observatory. So also this, like, this um, project was inspired by a talk by Rainer Weiss. So actually this talk was given at the Ontario Science Centre right here uh, last year, six months ago, thanks. Yes, as part of the Great Conversations lecture series. And Rainer Weiss is also a Nobel Prize winner in physics of 2017. All right, so I'm gonna start off with uh, gravitational waves. Gravitational waves are distortions in the fabric of space and time. So these can be caused by major, um, grav major events in the universe. Um, for example, merger of black holes, or merger of neutron stars, or supernovae, or even when um, the birth of the universe in the Big Bang. So now, when the, how do these, um, how can we measure these gravitational waves from Earth? For this, it's the exper we're using the LIGO, as I said before, the Light Inferometer Gravitational Observatory. Basically, it has an L-shaped kind of view, as you can see here. And when a gravitational waves hits the Earth, one of the arms of the L will contract, and the other arm will expand. So one of the key concepts of how the LIGO works is light. So let's say I had, for example, a laser, and I bounce it across the room. No matter how I bounce it, how many times I do it, the time it'll take for it to go there and come back will remain the same. So to measure how much are these arms shrinking or expanding, we bounce lasers through these arms. So these two lasers reflect across the mirrors and meet together and cancel each other out. out. So when there's no gravitational waves, we're not get detecting any, any light because the two, the two lasers are canceling themselves out. Um, and by the way, these arms are four kilometers each. We need to have them a large distance because gravitational waves, when they hit the Earth, they only change the diameter of the Earth by the width of like three atoms, which is very difficult to measure. And this will be even less when we have the LIGO here with only four, four kilometers arms. Now, these gravitational waves tend to come at a frequency of uh, 10 to several hundred hertz. Now, there are many other things that could affect these measurements that you're doing in the LIGO. For example, let's say you're walking next to the observatory or a train's passing or any type of seismic activity like tidal waves, um, tides, um, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, all these come at a, a similar frequency as these gravitational waves do. So for LIGO to work, we have to find a way to isolate these seismic vibrations. And then we can accurately measure if there's any gravitational waves coming and not confuse them with any other vibration. Okay, now um, actually, as I was talking before, uh, at the beginning of the lecture, Rainer Reese's talk, um, he was talking, he was talking about um, pendulums and how they were used inside the LIGO. And the key concept was, let's say I take this small pendulum I have, a thread with a bolt at the end, and I start swinging it slowly. As you can see, the bolt at the end is moving pretty fast. But if I increase the rate at which I'm vibrating at, here, you can see the bolt is barely moving. So yes, yeah, so these kinds of vibrations that are caused by the seismic activity, they're at a certain frequency which this mass will not actually move that much or will move less than at the top of the pendulum. So the LIGO uses a stacked pendulum, four stacked pendulums, which is called a quadruple pendulum. Each, pen, each pendulum acts as one of this pendulum, 
and each one of them will reduce the amount of vibration until it reaches the fourth pendulum in which we want to have the least possible vibrations. All right, so Rainer Reese in his lecture, he explained this concept and told everyone, why don't you try this out? So that's exactly what we wanted to do. So we decided to do an experiment and test out if this quadruple pendulum actually works. Yeah, so how did we make the pendulum? First, I attached four washers together and I attached a, a motor controller to it, to each of the washers, so called a micro bit, so it can detect the acceleration of each of the washers using a program language called Python, so it can see how, what's the difference in between the speed of all the washers. And the best part about the micro bits is that it's wireless, so I don't need to connect the transmitters to the receivers. They, it's wireless. Yeah, these micro bits will measure the horizontal vibration on each of the pendulums, and we'll relate wirelessly to our laptop, as she said. And oh, in addition, we also have a micro bit, basically accelerometer, on the top of the pendulum just to measure the vibration that's actually being caused before getting reduced by the pendulum. And so we need to test this out. So we wanted to simulate three different types of frequencies um, on our model of a pendulum, which actually you can see right here. So the first thing we did is we took a back massager, maybe some of you have heard of it, and um, this we placed it on top of our metal grating here, and back massagers, they tend to have lower frequencies. So the second tool we used to um, try to test this out was a cordless drill. So just a drill run on battery, which has a higher, a higher, like let's say a medium frequency. And last of all, we used a corded drill, which had the maximum amount of frequency. So yes, yeah, so for each of these different tools, we repeated the experiment thrice to get accurate data. <laughs> and each of them was run for at least 60 seconds. So now I'm gonna bring you the, the, um, the experiment. So the first thing we did, as I said, was run a back, back massager in it. And, but before that, we also, of course, measured the, get the, uh, got the baseline data for uh, the pendulums to see the before and then the after. So as you can see, most of these graphs are pretty stable because the, pe the pendulum was just not moving. Let's, we didn't apply any vibrations to it. There are just some small kinks due to the small rotation of these, um, of these circles, um, these weights basically, and some, some small error inside the measurements of the accelerometer. So then after we applied this ba uh, the back massager, the top, the top graph was the graph that we placed on top, right here. So this vibration, you can see, we got this graph. So this is an increase from this one. You can see all the noise that's getting got from the uh, massager. And slowly, on the first pendulum, you can not really see too many differences apart from some kinks. And at the last graph, at the fourth pendulum, at the end of the pendulum, there's barely any change. So we can see that um, we were able to cushion the vibration from up here and up here to the bottom of the pendulum. So then the second experiment was using a cord, cordless drill. And we ran the cordless drill against this. You can see again the same before. And after vibration is much more compared to the, pre the previous ones. But Pendulum 1, it, it's, it still has a lot of vibrations. Pendulum 2, it gets less. And eventually, at Pendulum 4, again, there's barely any vibrations. And last of all, the quarter drill. So um, we have, um, again, a lot of vibration up here. And at the bottom, um, very little, almost no vibrations. Um, and actually to measure the change in vibration across the, the pendulum, we made a transfer function. This is basically how much is the pendulum moving 
divided by how much the top of the pendulum was moving, or the pendulum before it was moving. So here's our graph. So the blue dots you can see is the transfer function for the back massager with the low frequency. And at first, it, as you can see, does not really cushion the vibrations as efficiently as the two others, the orange cordless drill and the gray corded drill. But, and um, eventually though, all of them, the first, the two of them, the quarter drill and cordless drill with the higher frequencies result in, um, at the end, almost no need to really cushion it anymore because three pendulums or two pendulums would be enough. But for the last one, the low frequency, it takes more time to try to cushion these vibrations. But at the end, we all have a relatively low transfer function, which means this worked pretty efficiently. So our conclusion, our conclusion is that um, the more number of pendulum systems you're going to put, let's say you put a fifth one or sixth one, the the more it'll uh, the more efficiently it'll work, as in it'll be able to decrease more vibrations, and. Um, yeah, and also they're more effective for higher frequencies, as we saw in the before graph. And um, pendulums were first studied by Galileo, and then um, there were the the theory of gravitational waves was got by Einstein. Um, also, by the way, this project um, I showed it at the Toronto Science Fair, and I got a silver medal for it. Um, this is me at the Toronto Science Fair with the same experiment. Um, now we're also going to give a small demo of the actual sensor, so you'll be able to see the graphs. So we have two sensors only this time, one at the bottom of the pendulum and one at the first pendulum. And we're going to run these two graphs on these laptops. So the graph you're seeing here represents the lowest pendulum. And the graph you're seeing here is the pendulum number one here. So um, now let's say I apply a slight vibration. Now on the first computer, we're going at um, plus minus 250 with the graph. Uh, you can't see the numbers from here, but it's plus minus 250. On the other hand, in the other graph, which represents the movement of the lowest pendulum, we have a plus minus of 15. And you can also visually see that the lowest pendulum is vibrating the least. Yep. The top one moves is moving the most in this case. Yeah, uh, there we go. Um, oh, also we emailed um, a description of this project that we made to Rainer Weiss to show him that we actually went home and did this project. Um, here's the email he sent us. So he appreciated us doing this project to actually test it out on our own. And thank you. Questions? Oh, lots of Is that working? Yes. Um, it looks to me like your pendulum lengths are all the same. Is that deliberate? Yes. And were the lengths in the actual quadrupole system at LIGO also the same length? All right, yeah, good question. So let me just get to the slide with that pendulum. Oh, there we go. So um, this is the LIGO's actual quadrupend pendulum here. So uh, yes, you can see in this diagram, the distance between the first two are shorter, while this one is a bit longer. So different lengths of pendulum can be used to stop different types of vibration. For example, if I take a longer pendulum 
and I will move it a little, as I did before. It's moving, but just a little bit more, and this barely moves. Let's say I make a shorter length. It'll take a bit more frequency of vibration to get it to stop moving. So we have to adapt these pendulums to specifically cushion the seismic vibrations. So this length is as such, so it's best suited for higher level vibrations as caused by seismic activity. Was there a statistical difference if you altered the weight of the masses between the spacers? Right there you have it as on the LIGO, it's uh, pendulums are 20 kilograms and the two lower masses are 40 kilograms. Was yes. there any statistical differences if you altered those masses? And second question is, where can I buy a micro bit? Ha. Huh. Okay, um, answering your first question first. Um, yes, so um, as we know, if, it, if a mass is heavier, it's difficult to move. So um, a heavier weight will, um, will move less if we vibrate it. But we never actually did try to change the weight on the pendulums. Um, but yes, it would be interesting to try that. Yes, and the microbits, um, actually, they're from, um, well, we actually got them as part of, um, we applied for uh, 10 free microbits. We got them, but they're not a product of Canada. Um, I don't actually know you can get them, but there's a site, BBC microbit, dot BBC microbit. Yeah, all you have to do is search BBC microbit, and you'll get a website where you can buy them. Thanks. All set then. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Raul Chu, our president. All right, well, uh, great presentation, Arushi, and, um, uh, oh gosh, sorry, Artash, <laughs> sorry about that, brain cramp. <laughs> that was really enjoyable, thank you very much. And uh, Jim, last telescope, really? <laughs> really? Okay, well, I I'm sure you've got other things up your sleeve, so uh, we'll, we'll watch for those in the future. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, what's going on in the next uh, little while? Well, we're done with our speaker nights until September, uh, but uh, recreational astronomy nights do continue. And our next one will be in four weeks' time or so on uh, June 19th. And Arnold Brody is going to be doing the sky this month. Uh, Ron McNaughton uh, is going to talk about teaching Neil to land, and I, I was Curious about what that would actually be. As in, Armstrong. As in Armstrong, okay. So that should be interesting. And we'll have Richard Blackman coming to talk about fiddling uh, with focus the DIY way. And this is the talk that he was hoping to uh, give earlier this year but had a hardware problem that uh, prevented him from doing so. So hopefully that's solved and uh, we'll hear from Richard uh, on the 19th. Okay, uh, lots of observing opportunities if the sky ever clears. Uh, we have uh, our next solar observing session on Saturday, June the 1st, and in the usual way, Sean is going to be letting us know either late on Friday evening or first thing Saturday morning whether it is a go, and uh, that'll be on our usual uh, channels uh, in social media as well as on the website. Uh, we also have the following week, the Dark Sky Star Party at Long Sioux Conservation Area. Um, first clear night 
uh, Monday through Thursday, the 3rd to the 6th of June. The following week will be uh, the City Star Party at uh, Bayview Village Park, and again, the first clear night of that week. And um, remember that that is also the lead up uh, for uh, the General Assembly of the RESC, which starts on the 13th. And that's a joint uh, set, uh, meeting this year with the AAVSO. Okay, other things that we're doing. Outreach, again, uh, a lot of things going on in outreach. We have our regular Millennium Square stargazing night, uh, and the next one will be on Friday, June the 7th, starting at 6 p.m., and again, a go or no go uh, announcement will be posted in the usual channels. Uh, we're also getting busy at the David Dunlap Observatory. Uh, the next event is on Saturday night, and that's a family night running from 9 until 11.30. So there won't be a speaker there, but there is a program uh, that will go on uh, uh, whether or not the sky is uh, cloudy or clear. So we will need people to help out. We've got about four people who have already uh, volunteered to uh, be on hand, but we can always help uh, use some more help. So if you're able to uh, give us some assistance, please uh, email ddo at rasco.ca and uh, let us know if you can give us some assistance that evening. It'll be very much appreciated. And uh, also, uh, Blake has uh, put an announcement onto the forum. Uh, for those of you who have um, uh, been getting email messages from that medium, uh, and there is a Google uh, form that you can fill in uh, as well if you are able to help us out with the program at put the DDO. Uh, by the way, uh, if you take a look on the Richmond Hill site uh, for the DDO nights, you'll find that there isn't very much there uh, starting from uh, the beginning of June. And the reason for that is because uh, the partners who are involved in the astronomical outreach have not signed their contracts yet. Uh, I expect to sign our contract with the uh, you know, city of Richmond Hill sometime in the next seven days. And it's just simply uh, we've had some uh, uh, delays in getting the language of the contract set up. Uh, we've changed a few of the clauses from what we had last year and it's got to go through all the usual stuff with the lawyers and hopefully that'll be ready and set to go uh, well before the end of the month so that as soon as I sign the contract they put up all the dates so uh, that's all starting to fall into place okay uh, and of course uh, CAO is um, available uh, we don't have to worry about winter uh, road conditions anymore, despite how it feels tonight. And uh, so, again, uh, please feel free to book online to reserve your space at the CAO. It is getting busy now, and remember that we do have the uh, uh, Rishi Krechen telescopes now in both the GBO and the new imaging SLO observatory. And um, uh, we expect that the SLO will be uh, commissioned and fully operational very, very soon. So we should start seeing people using that for imaging this summer. So lots going on there uh, as well. Uh, if you're a relatively new member or relatively new to observing, remember that we do have a telescope loan program which allows you to try out various types of uh, telescopes before you uh, buy your own. Uh, and uh, our uh, program managers for that. We have Peter uh, here tonight uh, in case anybody wants to uh, find out about that right away. Uh, but uh, again, you can book these things uh, also through the uh, website. Okay, and finally, the meeting after the meeting at the Granite Brew Pub um, down at Eglinton and Mount Pleasant after the meeting. Don't forget also that you can still re register for the General Assembly at York University. Uh, that runs uh, on Father's Day weekend. And uh, it's particularly an interesting uh, annual meeting this year because not only do we have the members from across the country uh, from the various RESC centers coming, but also we do have uh, joint sessions this year with the AAVSO, the American Association of Variable Star Observers. So um, we have some uh, other folks who are uh, new to us who we can meet. Uh, lots of public stuff going on as well, 
and um, at the uh, awards presentation at the banquet this year, uh, we will have three of our members receiving service awards, which is the highest um, recognition of uh, contributions to um, a center or the society that can be made. And uh, again, three of our members are going to be honored uh, that weekend. So it'd be nice to have a, a good show to uh, support them when they get their awards. Okay, so that's it until after the General Assembly on June 19th. Uh, thanks for coming tonight, and we'll see you soon. And Adrian has another announcement. Oh, it is ready. Great. Okay, so that means you can bring your DSLR or whatever else up to the CAO and put it onto that instrument.